All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today's teaching will be on one part of our spiritual armor. We have actually been studying this, so this is our last piece of armor that we have yet to study. Um, and it's the um, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And before we begin, as usual, let's start with prayer. Father Almighty God, I just thank you so very much for everyone that has come uh, to join us for this study. I pray that you just bless us with wisdom from above, Father. Place your hedge of protection around us. Keep out the devices, the lies, the confusion of the enemy in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that you just, uh, Holy Spirit, take complete control of this study. Let it be God's truth, not mine, that I share. And I just pray that you bless and sanctify this time that we have together. Um, give us understanding. And I pray, Father, that you just bless us with your wisdom, edify us, anoint us, sanctify us with the word. In Jesus' mighty, precious, matchless name, I pray and all God's children say, amen. The first thing we want to talk about is what was it that the ancient shoes for the armor, particularly of the Roman soldiers' uh, footwear, what was it like? Um, what was so special about it, right? Because we see all these pictures and they look like sandals, <laughs> open-toed sandals. And you would think steel boots were in order for any kind of um, protective armor, but that's not what we saw in ancient times. So what is it that made that strong Roman army um, so powerful uh, in res with respect to their gear? Their, what is it, that, especially their footing, when you, when you think of all the marching they did, um, you know, the distances that they would march. And, and even in, in combat, you would think, what is it that sandals did to help them uh, with their battles? Because remember, we are given the armor of God. And that's a supernatural armor. It's better than anything, any armor, any man can create on earth. Um, so when we think of this, yes, we're looking at, at a symbol of something that the human can put in perspective because you see it. However, understand that God's armor is bigger. It's, it's a spiritual armor for horrible spiritual battles that although we don't see them in the unseen, they are worse than any battle you can endure on the earth. Understand that supernatural battles, um, they can get into your mind. They can um, confuse you. Um, they can oppress you. Um, the enemy, remember, came to kill, steal, and destroy. You know, he wants to tear you away from walking toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. And God has not left us defenseless. Number one, greater is he in you, child of God, than he that is in the world. Number two, we are given spiritual armor. And, and we have to understand we have power on top of that armor by the power of the Holy Spirit because we are cleansed by the blood, because we belong to the one seated above all who has all under his feet, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the very word of God made flesh that God speaks things into existence with. So when we understand who we are in Christ, we should not be walking with our heads low. We should not be crouched down on the ground receiving kicks and every attack and every dart from the enemy. We need to rise up as a church and understand the power that we're given and understand the shoes that we've been given to wear and, and know how to walk in them in power. Because many Christians today are walking around letting the enemy convince you that you are powerless. That should not be. Not for you, child of God. If you truly have faith in the word of God, right? If you truly believe all that the living God who does not lie has said, you are to ground yourself on that truth. You are to root yourself in the word and then walk in the power that God, that God Almighty has given you as a child of the kingdom of God. So let's talk about this shoe, these shoes. And the only reason I'm telling you about the Roman soldier's gear is because I believe Paul is trying to help us understand because we are human. 
we all fall short of the glory of God, right? We have to, he has to give us a picture, a picture to start with, right? So that we try to get an understanding of the gear that you have on in the unseen, right? So he is, he is trying to describe something in a manner that we will understand, that will begin to make sense to us. Then we are to apply it to our spiritual armor, everything that we read about each piece of armor as pertaining to the kingdom of God, the soldiers in the kingdom of God, right? So let's read this. This I got from RomanBritain.org. And it uh, speaks of the ancient Roman soldier's footwear. To us, it looks like a sandal. And I'm going to try to enunciate um, the caligae, caligae, uh, that's what it looks like to me. Um, and so let's read. When first looking upon the caligae, it is difficult to see how such a flimsy piece of footwear could have been so beneficial to the Roman soldier. It does not offer much in the way of protection and does not give the impression of being very sturdy when going over rough terrain, because remember they did go through rough terrain while they were walking uh, for their battles. Um, so we continue reading, however, as with all things Roman, the design of the Caligae was meant to be functional in many ways. The openness of the Caligae enabled the soldier to wear them all day, to work, march, stand in them for long periods without discomfort. The leather strips were made so that they did not rub against certain parts of the feet and so cause sores. When a soldier had been on a march, on a march of 25 miles, which was commonplace, he would have aching feet, but no blisters. He could remove his caligae and dip his bare feet into the nearest river to cool them off, washing away the aches of the day. He was then refreshed and ready to continue. The underside of the caligae was fitted with studs that the soldier had to buy himself. They were not supplied by the army. Not only would they protect his feet over rough ground, but they also enabled him to use them in battle to stamp on fallen enemy warriors as his unit advanced into the opponent uh, hordes. This was effective as the Roman unit was at least 10 rows deep, so any fallen enemy would probably have been severely injured or dead soon after falling in front of the Roman advance. All right, so we know that um, a lot of the Roman battles were um, very powerful battles, right? Um, we know that they were well equipped and they held their place of, I want to say bullying, but that's not the word I want to use. Um, you know, they, they, they dominated the world in it for a long time, right? And so when we look at their armor, I'm sure that there was a lot of thought put into every piece of armor they had. So now let's transition to the more powerful armor that we are given by the creator of all, right? So let's go to Ephesians 6, and we're going to read from 10 to 13. Now today we're going to focus on the shoes, because if you've been with me for a while, I have done the other uh, studies. I have not yet published them. I will be publishing them uh, as time allows later on. I know that the Shield of Faith is on the, the YouTube channel. However, um, this will only be the second one published on the YouTube channel. But for us, uh, for our study group, we have uh, actually only the shoes left to, to do. Um, so let's read. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So you see a lot here that, that um, this armor will allow us to stand against the wiles of the devil, right? Um, we'll be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, right? Um, one of the important things that we have as children of God 
um, is the Holy Spirit, and we are not to be cowered down on the ground um, in the fetal position, just receiving blow after blow, allowing the enemy his, you know, um, his time to shine over us when we are given power over him. But somehow he has convinced many children of God that they are powerless over him. And that's not what we're told in the word of God. We have power. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Greater is he in us than he that is in the world. And so we are given equipment to be able to withstand the spiritual battles, which are many, which many times we don't see in the unseen what's happening. We don't see what's causing the, the, the oppression, you know, on that sister in Christ. We don't see what's causing the marital problems in that brother in Christ. Do you understand? So we have to be on the offensive sometimes um, with prayer. Prayer is powerful, but not many people use it. If you truly have faith, you should be on your hands and knees from the moment you get up and also before you go to bed. Remember that Daniel prayed three times a day. So it's important. Prayer is important. Prayer is powerful. And we have power. And, and there is something about prayer. Remember everyone who prayed, David prayed, Esther prayed, you know, and prayer with fasting is powerful. So there's something about prayer that is also part of our spiritual armor that we're given, the armor of God. So we're going to read the rest of Ephesians 6, um, at least 14 to 18. And it says, again, stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I have to make a correction on something I said earlier. Um, the one that I have published is not the Shield of Faith. I have not published that one to the channel yet. It's the Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Um, and then look at 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, that's capital S, Holy Spirit, and watching where, thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. So you see, we're given this spiritual armor. And I'm just going to go briefly through each one as a review. I'm not going in depth in uh, each one. The one that we're focusing again today is Ephesians 6, 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But just as a review, the breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness. Um, the breastplate in uh, Roman soldiers' armor um, would protect their chest, uh, which, you know, has your... Um, lungs and your heart, right? And we have the breastplate of righteousness. Understand that, you know, we read in the Bible that the heart is desperately wicked, right? Um, we read that we, um, when, when it comes to our heart, God looks at the heart of the human person, right? God looks at every heart, the intentions of your heart. Um, if you are a wicked person void of the Holy Spirit and who does not know our Lord and Savior, your heart is probably really cold. Your heart is probably hard towards certain things. Many people who are um, who are who don't have the Holy Spirit in them are spiritually blind to a lot of the tactics of the enemy, and they are many. Um, remember that. The enemy, we read, can disguise himself as an angel of light. There are things that he can do. He's, he's been on this earth longer than we have. So he has had plenty of time to devise wicked schemes, to plant seeds of, of lies, um, to create different religions, to do all kinds of things. He has, uh, he's called the father of lies for a reason. Um, there, the Bible says that the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. And so there is no truth in him, we read. And so his, his methods of planting seeds of doubt, of, of leading people into confusion, of, of influencing hate, right? Of um, making people against Christ, you know, we read, um, John said that there were already Antichrist spirits in the world. 
the Antichrist has not yet come, but he was on his way, right? Um, he's, he, John said he's on his way, and I don't have the verse in front of me, but you understand what I'm saying. There are in Antichrist, against Christ, spirits already in the world. Hate is, is spreading like a vicious virus, fighting, okay? And who do you think is influencing that behavior? The more people take God out of schools, the more people take um, um, a stance and put uh, satanic statues uh, in, in, in government um, buildings and they remove Ten Commandments, they remove anything of God, but they're allowing evil. God is in the business right now of giving people over to the lusts of the flesh. Oh, you want this? Okay, here you go. Um, but you're going to be deemed a reprobate. A reprobate, remember, if you look at the original Greek, is um, one who has failed the test, a counterfeit, right? And you don't want to be deemed a counterfeit um, because if you're deemed a counterfeit, a reprobate, right? If that's what you've chosen and the Lord comes today, guess who is going to be here for that seven-year period? There is so much arguing, even amongst the people of God, and it should not be. Most of the disagreements that you see on the Holy Word, on holy subjects that the Holy Spirit put together, holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, remember, right? Most of the arguments that you see today stem from people not studying and rightly dividing, but instead just hearing, hearing different speakers speak on the word. Instead of studying and rightly dividing and using Isaiah 28, 9, and 10 as to how we come to understand doctrine, right? Precip upon precip, which means order, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Instead, they just want to be receiving what men say and sometimes sometimes those people can be receiving that teaching from a false teacher false preacher wolf in sheep's clothing um there are men filled with pride which is an abomination to god and the lord resists right what we read and they have made themselves lords over the lord's sheep when they already had a lord so you understand. So we have to be really careful as, as a Berean, get in the word, study the word to make sure that the things that you're being told is the truth from God and not something men have created. Most people just want everybody to just get along. It's not that I don't want everybody to just get along. I want more people to get the truth from God. Amen. I want people to walk in the truth from God, rightly divided, to stick to the word, not just let's get along. Even, you know, you're making things up of the Bible. No problem. Let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya together. I want the truth from God. I want um, people to begin to read the word of God. Think of why we're called the salt of the earth, because remember that with that verse with those verses that speak of us being the salt of the earth it says but if the salt if the salt has lost its ability right to salt the earth i'm paraphrasing then what is it good for it's good for nothing but to be trodden down by men how are we the salt of the earth well think of the qualities of salt of among the qualities of salt two stick out salt adds flavor and salt preserves, right? As the children of God, we are to preserve the Lord's truth. And in John 14, when Jesus talks about those who keep his words, the word, the original Greek word that was translated to keepeth and keep, it means preserve. So we have to understand that when we, when we are the salt of the earth, we do not treat God's word as an unimportant thing, as a secondary thing to make men's word over God's. No, the Bible says, let 
God be true and every man a liar. So when I think of the armor and I think of how important, for example, the sword of the spirit is, which is the word of God, right? We, we have to remember when Jesus himself, after he fasted, after he was baptized and he went out into the wilderness and he was tested or tempted of the, of the enemy, he used the word, which is a sword, to quiet the enemy. And the enemy, after he was done, fled, right? Because he knew he could not get over on the word of God himself. Do you understand? So when we understand what we're given in the word of God and that our brothers, the disciples died standing on and preserving and um, protecting that which they saw from our Lord and Savior, what they witnessed, what they wrote, as Holy Spirit helped them remember everything that the Lord said to them, this word of God should not be treated lightly. It is not a secondary thing. It's the gospel. And we have in our possession the truth from God, holy wisdom from above, holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And we're not to make any man and glorify any man over what God said. They don't have permission to change what God said. It's written in a book for a reason for us to be able to refer to it. All scripture is profitable, right? So the breastplate of righteousness, we put on the Lord's righteousness. And with that, we protect our heart. We protect our lungs, right? God gave us the air to breathe. We protect our chest from vital blows from the enemy. If the enemy can get to your heart, how, can, how much can he darken it? You know, with lies, with the, with the spirit of oppression, with confusion, um, influencing, fighting. Listen, if you have problems, you're, you're to go on bended knee and pray and bind those spirits that are, that are causing those problems, uproot them and cast them out in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of his blood and by his spirit. You have everything that you need, child of God. Do you use it or do you crouch down in fetal position and allow the enemy free rent so he can stay and pound you and pulverize you and do all he wants because you are not standing up? You're not standing. What do we see in Ephesians 6? Um, stand, you know, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the, of the devil, right? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Stand, therefore, you know. So we're told you know, we have the, oh, and I forgot to highlight the belt of truth, so forgive me. I'm imperfect. We all fall short of the glory of God, right? Um, the, the belt of truth, what does the belt of truth do? It holds everything in place, right? It holds your sword, right? Which is the word of God, right? Um, we, we, when you know the truth from God, you are better able to recognize the deception when it confronts you, whether it's um, clothed in a, in a wolf in sheep's clothing, um, whether somebody is trying to teach you another gospel, um, whether whatever it is that somebody is trying to do, when you know the truth, you're better able to recognize a deceiver when he tries to confront you, to lead you away, okay? When you have the breast of, of righteousness on, you're protecting your heart from growing cold but you're wearing the righteousness of God. You're, you're protecting um, the very breath that God gave you with this breastplate from the blows of the enemy because you need to realize you're not wearing your own righteousness. You're right. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. You're, you have on the breastplate of righteousness. You have on Jesus' righteousness. He was the perfect lamb, right? He was the perfect lamb and he... And he is not coming as a lamb when he returns. He is coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you belong to him. You are part of his body. You are a member of his body, a member of his church, um, part of his flesh and bones, right? You are his purchased possession that he has promised to come back for. So you are not wearing your own righteousness. You are wearing the righteousness of the King of kings and Lord of lords walk in that righteousness. Your feet, we're going to talk about feet in a minute, so I'm going to um, skip over right now for this review to the shield of faith. So the shield of faith, how powerful is faith? You know, I've seen videos uh, online, great testimonies to the power of faith. There was a woman 
who uh, owned a jewelry shop, and I'm sure many of you have seen this video, and a gunman came, pointed a gun in her face, and he wanted to rob her. And she stood her ground. Now, please understand, I'm just sharing this information, okay? And, and she stood her ground and she pointed her finger in this gunman's face. And she said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you get out of my shop, of my store. And I'm paraphrasing what I remember. But do you know, child, child of God, that that man left? He left the store. And not only that, but you can see another powerful video of um, a tornado that was, uh, I don't remember where this was, but it was a tornado was coming near a village and it, there were believers there and they were praying in tongues against that tornado. And, and somebody was recording that event and you saw the tornado dissipate before your eyes. That's the power of God. When you have the shield of faith that you're told to take it up, to raise it up, it means, when you have the shield of faith, there is power in standing in faith and declaring the word. So whatever you're facing, you're given the holy word of God, which is a sword, and you proclaim against what you're facing. Not only that, but you believe greater is he in you than he that is in the world. You believe. You're a child of God. You've been given power over all the powers of the enemy and the spirits are subject unto them. So when you're confronted with, um, um, for example, marital situations where, you know, you're, you're, you're having all these problems, you bind those spirits and by the power of Jesus' blood and by God's spirit, you uproot them and cast them out to where God decides you should go because you don't want to just send them loose to go to somebody else to where God decides you should go. You know, you, you plead the blood of Christ over your family. You need to pray over your family. You know, when we read about 18, the praying always uh, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, you, you have to pray. You have to watch. Um, the, the, the things that we see happening in the world today, please do not mistake it. Jesus told us what to look for in order for us to know that his return was near and, and also the end of the age. Read Matthew 24. And so we're told there would be plagues. We're told there would be earthquakes in diverse places. We're told that nation would rise up against nation, which in the original language is speaking of races. You know, we're told a lot of, a lot of the symptoms um, that we would see uh, that would indicate to us and serve as a sign that the Lord's return was near. Do we believe what we read in the word of God or don't we? So raise up the shield of faith in battle, you know, because when you think of a shield, a shield is, is, is also uh, sometimes the first line of defense, right? Um, when, you're, when there's a blow coming, you're lifting your shield. When, when you looked at the Roman shield, it was shaped like a door. It was a pretty big thing. And so that's the first blow. And remember, you also have all this other armor, but that's the first thing that is going to protect you. And when you're protected, when you're holding up a shield, and if somebody is pushing against it or, you know, blows against it, it is also important to have the right, the proper um, footing, right? So that you don't slip. Um, protection on your feet so you don't get kicked or stepped on or, or whatever it is that 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 um, that happens in a in a in a battle right you want to make sure that you have the right shoes but these aren't regular shoes that we're given as part as part of our spiritual armor it's having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace we're going to look at that more in a minute and so the helmet of salvation are you saved or aren't you saved? Because your helmet protects your brain, right? Study what it means to be saved. Study what saves you. Oh, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved, right? Um, you are to um, keep yourself undefiled, not bow to another. You know, um, 
other consequences of the Bible don't take away or add to what is written in the book of Revelation. Otherwise, I would refer you to read what Revelation 22, what Jesus himself warned. And he, he said it, I, Jesus. Read that. There are some serious warnings in the Bible that cannot be ignored. You should not ignore the warnings. Read the warnings. Because all of scripture is profitable and made for correction for us, right? And, and made as our instruction in, in righteousness, right? We're given instruction in righteousness. Read it all, right? So that we understand it's not about works. It's not about us being under the law of Moses. But however, Jesus himself said, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. There is a, a straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. It's a defined path. God has a standard. And yes, um, believe in your heart and, and, and confess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you shall be saved. However, don't ignore the warnings of God. He tells us what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, who will enter the kingdom and who will not enter the kingdom. And we cannot ignore those details, okay? So I kind of jumped around, but I think I touched every area um, that's on here. Okay, so let's look at the word that was given to us. Uh, that means stand, right? Stand, therefore. That comes from uh, Ephesians 6, 14, right there in the beginning. Stand, therefore, right? And stand is 2476 in the Greek Strong's Concordance. And it's hestemi, hestemi, um, to make to stand. Um, we read in the usage, I make to stand, place, set up, establish, appoint, um, mid, I place myself, stand, I set in balance, way, in trance, um, I stand by, stand still, um, I stand ready, right? I stand firm, right? So when you stand in battle, if your footing was flimsy, I think you're going to fall at the first blow. You steal yourself and you stand because let me tell you something. When you're a child of God, if you think it's going to be all bliss and no worries, um, you're wrong. Um, Jesus said in this world, you will uh, experience tribulation. And it's not talking about the great tribulation, just everyday trials and tribulations. You will experience them. This world right now is led by Satan. This world right now, um, and we're, we, which we're not supposed to be friends with this world or conform to their ways, um, or to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God, the Bible says. This world is headed toward the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. And many blindly go that way. Many, the Bible says, Jesus said, will go that way. Few will find the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. Um, these are things in the Bible that many ignore. So we have to pay attention to the warnings also that the Bible gives on who will enter the kingdom and who will not enter the kingdom. There's, there are details in the Bible that many ignore. They don't want to hear the bad. They don't want to hear the warnings. They don't want to, they want to hear, hey, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And the enemy wants you to think that way. But you're given armor for a reason. Remember, his ways are sneaky, like a serpent. Um, if he can get in your head and plant seeds of doubt, if he can get in your head and convince you that God is not real, if he can get in your head and convince you that the word of God, uh, that there's no power in the word of God, that there's nothing to the word of God, that it was written by men. When you read and study the Bible and you realize certain facts about the Bible, you know that the old between the the time span between the Old Testament and the New Testament um, is what about five to seven hundred years, um, probably more. And yet, when you read the whole thing, it reads as if it was from one writer. Um, there are how many books in the Old Testament, and what sixty six books in the New Testament, and they complement each other. Though there were how many different writers. It writes as though one person wrote it. We know that holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. God authored this book. But the power of the Holy Spirit, that one part of the fullness of God, is the one that reminded these men of God, especially in the New Testament, what Jesus said. Jesus existed from the beginning. 
Who do you think, when you read in the Old Testament, take a concordance, and between the quotes, put word of God, word of the Lord. Who's the word of the Lord? Who's the word of God? There is only one word of God, and that's Jesus. He existed from the beginning. Everything was made by him. Jesus has existed from the beginning. Great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. So when you understand everything that the Bible says, and you understand that we're told that we know in part, we understand in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When we read stuff like that, we don't argue with the word of God because we don't have every detail. We know what God wants us to know. We know we understand what God wants us to know and understand. But make no mistake, you are called upon to study and rightly divide. You are called upon to follow the instructions in Isaiah 28, 9, and 10 as to how you come to understand doctrine, taking precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, okay? So first and foremost, there's a stand you have to take when you're thinking of spiritual battles. You are given everything you need. If you truly have faith, which means belief, trust, and fidelity in Christ, right? And you truly believe that the word of God is truth and it has power and it's a sword. And you truly believe that greater is he in you than he that is in the world. You are called upon to stand, not get down on the ground in the fetal position and allow the kicks and the torments and the and the um, oppression and, and the influence of the enemy. He is a defeated foe, we read in the Bible. And you belong to the one that had victory over death, hell, and the grave, and that has the keys to death and hell. So you should not be on the ground in fetal position, allowing the enemy to tear you down and tear your marriages down and tear your churches down. You are to stand make a stand, uh, set in balance, wait, uh, stand ready, uh, stand firm, steadfast. Because you know what? If you're a born again Christian, expect the enemy to uh, come at you in battle, in spiritual battle. But you're not left orphans. You have power. He is um, expecting you not to know that you have power. And so when we read, put on the whole armor of God, it's so important that every born again Christian understand exactly what that means to put that armor on. And you are to stand, you are not to get on the ground and allow the beat downs from the enemy. All right, so when we read about the foot gear, and that would be 15, right? Um, so we're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So let's take that apart in the original language and let's try and see what that means. So shod is 5-2, the Greeks 5-2, 5 in Strong's, hypo, hypo deal, um, and it means to bind under. Um, I put on my feet, I am shod, to bind. Um, what I, was explained to me by a pastor is that when you, today, the word shod is not used, except for horses. When you put the horse's um, horseshoes on, you know, they're bound on there, um, secured, right? Um, and that's good for them because sometimes they carry heavy packages. <laughs> if I were to get on a horse, poor horse. You know, when, when we get on, um, when we think of uh, all the weight that comes down on the horses, right? Um, and everything that they just carry and the long distances that they trod, you know, we, we understand that it's important that they have protection. What was explained to me is they use shod today in that, in that respect when speaking of the horseshoes uh, being secured, being uh, bound. Um, so when we think of um, the shoes, the spiritual shoes that we have on as a child of God, for our spiritual battles, because remember, we shine bright in the unseen. Um, remember that um, back, and I don't remember what chapter it is, but there were some, um, I think there were Jewish men 
who tried to exorcise demons using this Jesus, quote unquote, whom Paul preached. They did not know Jesus. They did not have the Holy Spirit in them because they did not know Jesus. And they tried to wrestle with demons by casting um, them out. And what happened? The demons got on them, attached on them. They said to him, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? These demons know who you are if you're a child of God. And in Jesus' name, you who shine bright in the unseen with the light of, and love of Christ, you know, you're a force to be reckoned with. But if the enemy can convince you that you're not with lies, because remember, there's no truth in him, then you have basically allowed him a foothold into your mind to deceive, to make you powerless. And you have in turn done what Eve did. You've believed the serpent instead of God. Okay, you were obedient to the serpent instead of obedient to God by believing what he is telling you, the lies that you're powerless, that you're weak, that you have no power over what God has said, which you are a child with the Holy Spirit in you who is greater than the one in the world. You have power over all the powers of the enemy and all the spirits are subject unto you. Whatsoever you shall, you shall bind shall be bound. Whatsoever you shall loosen shall be loosened, right? But you either believe God, child of God, or you believe the lies of Satan. If you believe God, then it's time to stand in the shoes that God has put on you, okay? And so bind those shoes. What shoes? Well, we read with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How you walk in this life um, as a child of God who is saved by believing the gospel believing the good news, right? Jesus died for you. Your debt is paid. You are saved by grace for believing in the one God sent, right? You walk in that power and everything that comes with that. What do we learn? Well, somebody who believes in Jesus and receives him, right? Puts him on. Well, they're given the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, which we read, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Lord is doing a tremendous thing on the earth right now. And that Holy Spirit in you is greater than the one in the world. That Holy Spirit in you is restraining evil before the evil day. That Holy Spirit in you gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. God's truth, wisdom from above. The Holy Spirit in you has given you power. The Holy Spirit in you um, is going to help you understand the word which sanctifies, which sets you apart as holy unto God. You are to walk in that power. Okay? So the thing we have to understand uh, um, that having the spiritual shoes from the armor of God is you walking as a child of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. You, believing the gospel, having the gospel of peace, you, you have an unction to go forward and share the good news, but to share the good news and stand, expecting battles so that your shoe will not slip, your, your foot will not slip, right? Expecting the battles, but standing nevertheless in the power that you're given as a child of God, spreading the good news, trying to pull as many as you can out of the fire. You know, we have as the salt of the earth to preserve the Lord's truth, but we also are told to spread the good news. I didn't give you the other part of salt. So we know that salt preserves, right? We're to preserve the Lord's truth. Stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said, right? But salt also adds flavor. And how do we add flavor to others? When we share the good news, we enrich lives, leading people to their blessed hope. So we have an unction from God. Not only are we to stand valiantly as the children of God on this earth, as the light of the world, leading many to the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life, right? Which is Christ. He's the life, right? He's the truth. He's the way. He's the only door by which we enter into the presence and throne of God. We, as the light of the world, 
We're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We're ambassadors for Christ. We have something that we're supposed to be doing on this earth. It's not about works. It's about who you are. The, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. You are the light of the world. You are um, the body of Christ. You're still on the earth. And God expects you, child of God, to with the gifts that he has given you, to be about your father's business until his return, okay? So you have these shoes and they're bound on your feet. Um, the gospel of peace. When we think of the peace that God gives, which we're told surpasses all human understanding by believing in the gospel, right? And we're walking, walking valiantly, even in the midst of storms, how much do you see in the world today? You should not be in fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. You should not be a child of fear. If anything, you should be getting excited that everything you see are signs that the Lord's return is near. If you have truly detached yourself and not made yourself um, part of this world, what do I mean by that? You're in the world, but you're not of the world, we read, right? This is not our home. We are to keep our eyes on things above, not on this earth. Because when you think, when you, when you have invested yourself entirely on this earth, and the Bible says the earth will pass away, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. You know, we, we read everything happening. The earth right now is, is crying out, right? We are seeing sinkholes in diverse places, volcanoes that were dormant for hundreds of thousands of years are waking in record number. We have um, sea life dying, um, whales beaching themselves, um, starfishes, uh, sea turtles. Go and, see, go and research. Go and Google um, sea turtles uh, beaching themselves and see how many stories pop up. Go and research whales beaching themselves, dolphins beaching themselves. There's something wrong here, okay? And it reminds me of Hosea, I think it's 4-3. You know, there's a lot going on in the world. There are all kinds of things going on in the world. If you have no blessed hope, then poor you because you're going into a dark place emotionally. You're, you know, the Bible says that men's heart will grow colder for looking at the things that are happening in the world. I'm not of the world. To me, this tells me God is shaking the earth and the Lord is coming. God is shaking the earth and the Lord's return is near. And if you have studied the subject of the rapture, which is a very controversial subject and it should not be, it's something we're supposed to comfort ourselves with comfort one another with and and when you study and you rightly divide and i i would refer you to the um rapture series uh and i will try to remember to link them underneath this video in the description area because when you know from scripture that the rapture jesus himself shows us will be before the 70th week before that seven year period and please before you go on and argue against that, I, I plead with you to go and look at the Bible proof that I present to you. It's not about me. It's about God. I, I seek no glory. My aim is always to edify and to do what I have been put on this earth to do in this moment, in this time. Every child of God, listen, the gifts of the Spirit are real. Every child of God has a calling. Every child of God has received a gift, whether you know what it is or not. And I would recommend that you pray to God, pray that Holy Spirit show you what your gift is, what it is that you're supposed to be doing on the earth today. Because when you, when you understand, then God will always supply what you need in order for that gift to be fluent, in order for you to always um, have what you need to walk in that gift. Do you understand? So, um, and, I, and I'm digressing, but I'm speaking what the Holy Spirit is putting in my heart. We are not to be just sitting here passive, waiting for the Lord's return, looking at our watch, doing nothing. There is so much to do. There are so many um, under the influence of the enemy. There are so many that are influencing hate, that are walking unfortunately, toward the broad way that leads toward destruction. There are so many 
that are headed toward eternal fire and they have no clue because they have been blinded. We're not called upon to try and convince them of the gospel. We're just told to spread the gospel, share the good news. And if they ask questions, to be ready to answer about why you believe. So in order to do that, you would have to study, right? You would have to study. You would have to rightly divide. So I, I, I want to express to you that it's important that each and every one of us understand how we're walking with God. You know, what it means to walk with God. All right, so let's talk about what it means to have your um, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, I talked a little bit about what it means to walk in the power God has given you, um, to walk knowing you are a child of God, um, to stand firm, understanding that spiritual battles are going to come. Um, but you have everything you need um, in the spiritual armor and the power God has given you to stand. Um, you are to stand firm on the truth from God, nothing wavering. Um, when you think about everything that uh, will be needed for a battle, let alone a spiritual battle, um, we are to understand um, what we're given, that we have everything we need, that we are more powerful um, because of the one inside us, um, that we have been given power over all the powers of the enemy, that we belong to Jesus Christ who is seated above all and has all under his feet, that we stand firm, nothing wavering on the truth from God, um, that we put on the whole armor, not just one piece, that we pray also um, and we hold up our shield of faith, right? Um, faith, believing, trusting, uh, and being faithful to Christ, um, that we're wielding our sword, uh, the sword of the spirit. So in all that, the shoes um, and, and everything that we need on our feet to be able to walk the walk of a believer, sharing the gospel, but understanding that we're walking as soldiers for the kingdom of God in a world that will not like us, <laughs> we're not going to be popular in a world that, um, you know, we're, we're peculiar people. Remember, you know, we're, we're, we're a pe peculiar people. Um, we're not of the world. We're not standing in line um, with what Satan is handing down. We are soldiers for the kingdom of God, and we're to walk and stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said, with the shoes, understanding that, that the gospel that we're given is the truth from God, that the gospel saves, right? That, that we have um, an unction as children of God, walking with God. When you think about everything that you read throughout scripture about walking, right? In, in faith, um, in power, um, standing firm, nothing wavering. So you're not driven east and west, uh, left and right with every wind of doctrine that's out there. Um, but we're supposed to stand firm, knowing who it is that we belong to, knowing that we are part of Jesus' body and knowing who Jesus is, the one that has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So when we put on these shoes of the gospel, and we stand firm, stand our ground, not coiled on the, on the floor in the fetal position, just receiving blow after blow against your marriage, against your church, against you know um, whatever the enemy has spun um, to confuse even your children. Um, you're a child of God. Get in the battle. Get on your knees in prayer. Stand firm on the gospel of truth. Stand firm on what you've been told. Wield your sword. You know, hold up your shield. There are things that you're going to have to do as a believer to stand your ground in the battle. It's going to be a spiritual battle. Why? Because you're headed toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life, which few will find. The enemy doesn't want you there. You're, you're um, standing against the mass and the majority who are just headed toward the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. 
So you're going to have people come against you. Um, you're going to have those that the enemy uses who bow down to him come against you. And you're not left as orphans. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. Do you or do you not believe it? So um, preparation, when we're thinking of the preparation of the gospel of peace, is the word hitoimacia, and I'm sorry, I'm sure I butchered that. Um, preparation, foundation, firm footing, right? Readiness, the readiness of the gospel, um, ready to stand your ground, ready to share the gospel when the opportunity comes, standing firm, nothing wavering on the truth from God. Think of every way that your feet will be engaged in the battle when you walk in the power you're given, when you walk toward um, the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life, understanding you're going to encounter resistance. You're going to encounter um, those who are fighting against the truth that have no truth in them. Understand we're going to come across those who don't want the truth from God. And you are soldiers that are going to be um, heading toward that resistance and you stand firm anyway and you put on the whole armor and you hold up the shield of faith and you wield your sword and you stand firm have a firm footing you you have um i i want to say cleats but whatever you have under your your shoes that will help you stand in truth in power against the lies, against those that are coming against God's truth. You just push forward. You have many brothers and sisters in Christ who are also anointed to be in battle here. You're not left alone. You have a huge family in Christ, and there is going to be a lot of resistance that comes against you. You are a battle warrior for God for the kingdom, for the creator of everything. Listen, Satan is a created being. His ways are through lies, smoke and mirrors, confusion, right? He doesn't want you knowing the truth. He doesn't want you headed toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. So what is he going to do? He's going to attack everything around you. Any Look for any open doors that you may leave in order to try and, and, and get his foot in the door. But you are to stand your ground. Remember that even Peter, Peter, who denied the Lord three times, the Lord forgave. Peter, who, when the Lord said, come, he it, it took a lot. I, you, you put yourself in the position of Peter and you see a figure coming toward you. It's nighttime in the water and you're on a boat. And, and he, he reveals to you that he's the Lord and he tells you, come. So you're, how ready, how ready will you be to step off the firm ground of the boat <laughs> onto the water that to a, the human mind from your experience, you know, you're going in. Um, and he, in faith, stepped out of the safety of the boat to walk toward the Lord. And so long as he, it took faith to do that, is what I'm trying to tell you. It took, it took a lot, I'm sure, to step off the safety of the boat. And you know what? I'm going to step on water because my Lord is stepping on water. And I trust that he is going to help me walk that way. And I believe for a while he, he was pretty strong in that faith so long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. But what happened? He turned away from Jesus to look at the storm. And the storm became bigger than the one in front of him. And so he began to sink because fear got a hold of him. Fear is a lying spirit. And so fear had convinced him that the storm was bigger. There's Jesus in front of you. He just helped you walk on water a little bit ago. But now you're looking at the storm. You've taken your eyes off of Jesus. And he began to sink. And still, even in the midst of sinking, all he had to do was call out to Jesus. And the Bible says immediately Jesus saved him, albeit with a soft rebuke. Why did you doubt? You know, we have to remember that the enemy will try and make all kinds of things, including the problems you see in the world around you today, 
seem bigger than God. And it is up to you holding your shield in faith and standing your ground, your firm footing with the readiness of the gospel. You know what? Everything that you read in God's word, he has given you power. You have power over all the powers of the enemy. You, whatsoever you bind shall be bound. Whatsoever you loose shall be loosened. Heaven agrees with you, is the way another sister in Christ put it. We have to make sure that we understand who we are in Christ. Put on that whole armor. Understand what the armor is and then get ready for battle. Because whether you understand it or not, um, when you're a child of God, Satan comes at you way more viciously than he would somebody who's already headed toward him because, you know, they make his um, job very easy. Um, he, uh, when, when he attacks, he wants to attack. He wants to knock you, child of God, off of the path that you're on. He doesn't have to do anything to these people that are already headed to his way. They make his job easy. It's you who are like a, a prize medal for him, an honor badge. If he can get you to leave Christ, if he can get you confused and unbelieving, um, if he can get you to sin uh, against God, to do those things that God finds disgusting. You know, he wants to make sure, he, he's the accuser, right, of the brethren. That's what we read. So you have to put on this armor and you have to understand what it means to put on the armor. And when we're speaking of the shoes, the shoes that God puts on your feet, they're shoes of power. They're shoes of, of, of a knowing wisdom from above. They're shoes that have you understanding your place on the earth is as a light in this world, as the salt of the earth. You're not of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You are not to act like those in the world. And remember in the Old Testament how many times the people of Israel were warned, don't conform to, to the place I'm sending you to, basically. I'm paraphrasing. And many of them did. The enemy's tricks are many. And, and you have to understand, true peace will not come on the earth until the Prince of Peace himself comes on here. There's going to be a false peace by the Antichrist kingdom. For the first half of that seven-year period, he's going to come and he's going to pretend he's somebody he's not. And then he's going to fool many. The great delusion. And, and those people on the earth here during that time are in danger of sealing themselves to him eternally. The church will not be here during that time. Um, so why more than ever we receive the, the, the attacks from the enemy because he does not want to be success, us to be successful. He wants to lead us away from the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life, okay? So we read in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. As we're walking in the shoes that the Lord has, has put on our feet, right? As, as the shoes he's given us as our armor that we bind to our feet, right? We have the gospel. We share the good news, the good news of the gospel, trying to save as many out of the fire as possible, but make sure that you have that belt of truth, that you understand the truth from God, that you are um, somebody who studies and rightly divides. Um, because that way, when people come to you with hard questions, as many will, and they'll want to know why you believe what you do, that you'll be able to answer. Many Christians aren't ready to answer questions like that. So they end up looking like, mm -hmm, I just believe because my mother believed, because my dad believed, because my pastor told me to believe. Understand why you believe what you do, you know, and stand firm and root yourself in the truth from God. Um, if we don't root ourselves and we only weakly have a, put a, have a foot on the gospel, you will be driven left and right by every wind of doctrine out there. And believe me, there are so many, so many lies out there, so many wolves in sheep's clothing, so many false teachers, false preachers, but even some that just innocently mistake in scripture because they don't study and rightly divide because they heard it from such and such, because they heard it from this pastor, because they heard it from that pastor. I have news for you. If you take a, a big room and you put a bunch of would-be Christian scholars and, 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 and pastors of all kinds in that big one room, and you throw maybe subjects like well, some of the most controversial, um, the rapture, <laughs> in there, there are going to be arguments that come 
out because they will not all agree. And why? Because God's word says one thing. And when you study it and you rightly divide and you engage the Holy Spirit to help you understand, the truth will come out. But there are many who put meaning in God's word and do not study, but rely on their own understanding and what they've heard by the words of men instead of standing firm on the word of God and letting God be true and every man a liar. So um, this is the word that was uh, translated as the gospel, um, but it means good news. It means the good news of the coming of Messiah, the gospel, um, God's good news that we're given. Remember that when we read the gospels, um, we're given a lot of information. And the Bible says that all scripture is profitable. It's, it's our instruction in righteousness, right? With, within those pages, you read of warnings that were given of those who will not enter the kingdom. Please don't ignore those. You know, um, yes, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved. But then what of the warnings? Do not ignore those warnings. Jesus gives a very serious warning to those who add to or take away from the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which revelation means unveiling, um, which we, receive, we are to receive blessings for hearing and reading that book. And we are not to ignore those warnings because God does not lie. And what he's spoken, he will fulfill. So don't ignore the warnings of the Bible. Um, in John 14, 1, we read the following, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said that. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Today, especially, there are many people who are walking in fear instead of walking with the armor, the shoes, the, the shoes that were given as armor that you know, show us that we're to stand firm, to root yourself, to walk in the power of God that you're, you're given as a child of God, to walk knowing the truth, you know, um, to, to wield your sword, to share the gospel, you know, um, fearlessly, to understand uh, that you have greater is he in you than he that is in the world, to not be afraid to pray, to not be afraid to bind those spirits that are causing problems in your marriage, causing problems in your home and your relationships with your children, you know, whatever it is, bind, uproot, cast out in Jesus' name, by the power of Jesus' blood and by God's spirit. Pray for those who have become your enemies that they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God can change their hearts. We are not to, to, to lay down in a fetal position as if we have no power, but stand firm in the shoes and walk in them in power that the Lord has given you. Um, in John 14, 27, we read the following. Peace I leave you. Jesus said this. Peace I leave you with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So once again, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Jesus told us that because that's how the enemy gets a lot of people bound when they have been set free. He tries to bind you in fear. Um, he tries to convince you that fear is a tangible power over you when it does not. Fear is a lying spirit. So you need to understand how you're going to stand, how you're going to walk, and what shoes you're going to wear. You should be wearing the shoes that the Lord has given you as armor, knowing who you are, child of God. In John 16, 33, we read the following. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, the, we're not promised because we're children of God that we're going to have a peaceful existence with absolutely no problems. If anything, you should know that the battle is real, a spiritual battle. And the enemy is going to come at you the closer you get to God. Um, you will have tribulation, trials and tribulation. That's speaking of everyday trials and tribulation. Please do not mistake in this for the great tribulation. We are promised everyday trials and tribulation. It's not about the great tribulation, which Jesus himself shows us we are not in that time in the book of Revelation. And again, I refer you to the rapture series, especially part three. Um, so in Isaiah 26, three, we read, thou will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And in Philippians 4, 7, we read, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do not let the enemy steal your peace. Do not let the enemy get in your head. Um, if he can convince you that you are powerless, if he can convince you that you, are, that you have something to be afraid, that the problem you face is bigger than God, then you've given him a foothold. That's not trusting in God. That's not trusting in everything that you read in the word of God, which we've been told is truth. That's agreeing with Satan and not agreeing with God. And there's a difference and you need to put it in your head. Um, plant your feet firmly on the truth of God. Root yourself, the Bible says, because if you don't root yourself and you have one foot weekly, maybe in the gospel, or maybe one foot weekly um, in the world or stronger in the world, but one foot weekly on the gospel, you know, yes, maybe I'll go to a good place if I die. Maybe that's their thinking, right? Maybe that's your thinking. You're not trusting. And those who will be in perfect peace are those who have their mind set up to trust God. Speak the word of God over your household. Speak the word of God over your situation. The Bible says, pray as if those things that are not are that you're trying to pray for. Speak them. There's power in words, okay? Um, in Romans 10, 14 to 17, we read the following. And just so I can add a, a, another note to that. When you are wearing the shoes that God has set before you as a child of God, and you are standing firm on the word of God, nothing wavering, on the gospel of peace, and you have your faith, trust, believe, you're faithful to Christ, fidelity, then you are one of those people that should be at peace even amidst everything that's happening because you're trusting that God is bigger. You're not allowing anyone to steal your crown. You know that you're to look up because your redemption draws near. Because Jesus, who is the word of God, who is truth and does not lie, has given you signs to look for in order for you to know that his return was near. And my, oh my, don't we see them today? You cannot even argue against all those signs because they're happening today, okay? Um, so let's read uh, Romans 10, 14 to 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, it, it's Isaiah, um, says, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, when we walk in these shoes that we've been given and we're sharing the good news of the gospel and, and we're ready to tell people, um, you know, anybody who asks why we believe, you know, of our blessed hope, um, we're walking in what the Lord says are the beautiful feet you know, he has blessed our feet. You know, I, I, I have a picture in my head of, of Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, the King of kings, right? And he's washing all the disciples' feet. And, and even when somebody tr like Peter tries to protest and say, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Like, you know, you're the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to let you wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, then you have no part of me. And then what did Peter say? He said, well, then wash my feet, my head, wash everything. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 you don't get it. You don't need, you know, he who is clean doesn't need, but just, you know, wash their feet. And I read a little bit about that. And, you know, in ancient times, Jesus' time, 
the terrain there was very dirty. They wore open sandals on their feet and the dirt would always, you know, their feet would be very dirty. Um, and when they'd come to dinner, they just regularly would wash their feet before supper, you know, um, because their feet would be very dirty. It was something they did back then. And here is the savior of the world. He's washing their feet. But I believe it's not only um, as an example, because you remember he explained it was an example of what you are to do. I've washed your feet, you wash others. You know, but it's also symbolically, I believe, a, a blessing and, and a humble thing together to do for somebody you love. Um, something that, you know, if we truly are people of God, who love others, even, even strangers, right? You want them to come to the truth. You don't want them to die. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, your heart should, should be grieved at the thought of somebody burning in a fire because they didn't hear the good news or they didn't, they didn't know they had an option of being saved, right? God's argument to them is, I send somebody to you at the end of, when, at the end of everything, this is what God will tell them. I send somebody to you to send you the good news and you rejected it. You did not want the good news. You did not want me. I gave you a chance. I gave you a choice. And instead you chose Satan. We've been told even from the Old Testament, and remember we read things written for time, were written for our learning. Um, they're a shadow of things to come. Um, we don't ignore the lessons that we learn in the Old Testament, because there's so much value to them. And we are not to ignore those things that we learn, that, that many of them are a picture of things that the Lord fulfilled. You know, when we think of why in the world was it that, that Abraham was tested in such a way so as to pretend that he was going to um, sacrifice his son. And then the Lord was like, nope, I just wanted to see if you do it. You know, why? Why did that happen? Well, on that very same Mount, Mount Moriah, um, on that very same place where the Lord tested Abraham, right, um, is the same place that Jesus was crucified. Um, the Lord gave his one and only son, do you understand, as a sacrifice for us because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. These are the things of God. His ways are higher than our ways. You know, we, we are not to understand everything that God knows. We understand what God gives us to know, but understand that the, the Old Testament has a lot of um, typologies, a lot of things that um, are a picture of good things to come. You know, what the Lord did for, for us, what, what God did for us in order for us to be saved, for us to have a place of salvation. So when we understand everything that Jesus did for us, everything that he suffered, right? Because when you look at the, at the depictions and you read, um, you know, the, the depictions like um, Jesus of Nazareth and, and, and the Passion of the Christ, and you, you visibly see them at what we read in scripture that Jesus suffered. Um, and he did it for us. And at any point, he had power to call angels to stop the whole thing, but he went through it because there was a reason behind it. Um, and we, as children of God today, walk in power because of that act that he did. Um, this is something not to be taken lightly. This is something that um, he did it for us and now we have power, so why do we allow Satan a place when we're told not to give him a place? Do you understand? We're not to agree with him. We're to agree with God and stand firm on his truth. Nothing wavering. Okay. So, and I'm almost done and I appreciate your patience. You know, in God questions, we read the following. What is the readiness of the gospel of peace? Ephesians 6, 11 to 17 instructs believers in Christ to put on the whole armor of God as a defense against Satan's tactics. This armor includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 15 says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The New Living Translation words it this way, for shoes, 
put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. The gospel of peace is the message that Jesus gave to those who trust in him. According to 14, John 14, 27, Romans 10, 15. It comes with the assurance from God that we are his children and nothing can snatch us out of his hands. John 29, 1 John 5, 13. It outlines clearly what is required to become a child of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6, John 1, 12, um, Romans 10, 8 to 10. Any other message is a false gospel. We continue reading. The word readiness implies constant vigilance. A victorious soldier had to be prepared for battle. He had to have studied his enemy's strategies, be confident in his own strategy, and have his feet firmly planted so that he could hold his ground when the attacks came. A soldier's battle shoes were studded with nails or spikes like cleats to help him keep his balance in combat. He knew that if he lost his footing and went down, it wouldn't matter how great the rest of his armor was, the enemy had him. When we are ready with the gospel of peace, we live with the understanding that we are continually under attack from Satan. Second Timothy 4.2 says to preach the word with ready in season and out of season. The peace shoes that God supplies his soldiers have two purposes, defensive and offensive. offensive. Um, in order to defend ourselves against the flaming arrows of the evil one, according to Ephesians 6.16, 6, we must have confidence of our position in Christ. We must stand firm in the truth of God's word, regardless of how terrifying the circumstances may be. 1 John 5.14, we must understand grace without abusing it. Romans 6.1-6, 6, six. remember that our position in Christ is not based on our own abilities or worthiness, Titus 3.5, and keep our belt of truth and breastplate of righteousness securely fasten 2 Timothy 1.12. Um, we continue, when Satan attacks with a flaming missile of doubt, such as, if God really loved you, he wouldn't have let this happen, we dig our peace shoes into our turf of God's word and reply, it is written, all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8.28. When Satan, when Satan stabs from behind with, remember what you did, we dig in more deeply and reply, it is written, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Ooh, I'm getting goosebumps. We continue reading. In addition to standing our ground, shoes are also for moving. God expects us to go on the, the offensive and take the gospel of peace to others. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Sharing our faith is one of the best ways to maintain our own sure footing. God knows that. When we are active in speaking of him to others, we not only charge into Satan's territory, but we dig our shoes more deeply into truth and will be much harder to dislodge. When we have studied to show ourselves approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15, we are ready to stand firm in the gospel of peace, no matter what the enemy brings against us, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So in Hebrews 10.23, we read, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Um, some of the things that I like to do is I like to look at the original wording. And I would encourage you to um, research so that you fully understand the original language and what was being said here. Because many times we, let's face it, we, we don't... Um, we might misinterpret something that was uh, interpreted in the English language, and yet we miss the foundational truth um, as per the original language. I'm a, a, a huge fan of just, uh, I want, if I, I wish I, I knew Hebrew, I wish I knew um, um, Greek so that I'd read it in the most uh, original form that we have, right? Because we know there are copies of the originals but God's word lives on and many copies were made for this reason, because Satan has always been against the truth. Satan has always tried to be done with God's people 
but you see both exist today and they exist because what did the word of God say himself? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will live on, right? My, will, my word will live forever. It will not, there, God's word is not disappearing, neither is God's people because they're, uh, they're, they're uh, an everlasting kingdom. They're a kingdom that will exist and will not be defeated. Do you understand? It's been spoken by the Lord through his holy chosen men of God and, and the, anything that the Lord has spoken through those holy chosen men of God will not return to him void. It will do exactly what he said it will do. Um, so 2722, so you get a, an understanding here, is what was translated, um, that Greek word, katicho, 2722 in uh, Strong's, was what was translated to the English phrase, let us hold fast. And what it means um, is to hold fast, hold back, I hold fast, bind, arrest, I take possession of, lay hold of, um, detain, restrain, I hold a ship, keep its head, you know, stand firm. Um, let us hold fast, let us, the profession of our faith, um, don't be wishy-washy on your faith, don't be weak so that you're driven um, left to right to every wind of doctrine out there. Again root yourself root yourself in the truth stand firm on what you believe you either believe or you don't believe there's no lukewarmness to the lukewarm the lord will spoo you out of his mouth okay first corinthians 16 13 i'm sorry i'm kind of speeding through because i'm pressed for time um watch ye stand fast in the faith quit you like men be strong in the amplified version it reads that same verse be on guard, stand firm in your faith, in God respecting his precepts and keeping your doctrine sound. Act like mature men and be courageous, be strong. Um, in Ephesians 4, 7 to 11, we read, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, uh, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended in the same is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers um, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, listen, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint su supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. When we understand what the gospel is, when we understand everything that the gospel is, um, and we stand firm, nothing wavering on the truth of the gospel and the one who gave it. I think it helps us then be able to answer questions about the gospel when we're confronted with those difficult questions that we're able to give somebody an answer to why we believe the blessed hope that we do, right? So we read, again, God questions, what is the gospel? The word gospel literally means good news and occurs 93 times in the Bible, exclusively in the New Testament. In Greek, it is the word, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that, um, from which we get our English words evangelist, evangel, evangel, and evangelical. The gospel is, broadly speaking, the whole of scripture. More narrowly, the gospel is the good news concerning Christ and the way of salvation. The key to understanding the gospel is to know why it's good news. To do that, 
we must start with the bad news. The Old Testament law was given to Israel during the time of Moses. The law can be found, can be thought of as a measuring stick, and sin is anything that falls short of perfect according to that standard. The righteous requirement of the law is so stringent that no human being could possibly follow it perfectly in letter or in spirit. Despite our goodness or badness relative to each other, we are all in the same spiritual boat. We have sin, and the punishment for sin is death, i.e. separation from God, the source of life. In order for us to go to heaven, God's dwelling place, and the realm of life and light, sin must be somehow removed or paid for. The law established the fact that cleansing from sin can only happen through the bloody sacrifice of an innocent life. The gospel involves Jesus' death on the cross as the sin offering to fulfill the law's righteous requirement. Under the law, animal sacrifices were offered year after year as a reminder of sin and a, excuse me, and a symbol of the coming sacrifice of Christ. When Christ offered himself at Calvary, that symbol became a reality for all who would believe. The work of atonement is finished now, and that's good news. The gospel also involves Jesus' resurrection on the third day. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The fact that Jesus conquered sin and death is good news indeed. The fact that he offers to share that victory with us is the greatest news of all. To reject the gospel is to embrace the bad news. Condemnation before God is the result of a lack of faith in the Son of God, God's only provision for salvation. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. God has given a doomed world good news the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we read in the following, um, this is from King James, King James Bible online.org, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And Deuteronomy 5.33, ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Genesis 5.22-24, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 300 60 and five years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him um, by faith. This is Hebrews, Hebrew 11, five um, by faith. Enoch walk, was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Um, so, one of the things and one of the reasons why I included all those verses is because when you think of the walk that we have before us as a believer, and we think of the spiritual armor, the shoes that we're given, right? And we're told in the Bible time and time again, from the Old Testament to the New, about the way and the things that please God and how we should walk um, in this life that we're given in a way that is honoring God, that is glorifying God, that is pleasing to God, right? And if you truly love God, why wouldn't you want to please him and take care and, 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 and live according to the things that please our Lord, that are not offensive to him, right? And so whenever we think of the shoes that were given, be very diligent in, in studying all the ways in the Bible that we're instructed and, 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 and told what pleases God in the way that we walk and carry ourselves as children of God, as children of God who have these bodies who are no longer, these bodies that are no longer our own, right? They were purchased at a price, right? They belong to Jesus. And so we honor God 
by living and keeping them holy and undefiled in our walk with him. So we talked about the salt already. We didn't talk so much about the light, that we are the light of the world, right? Um, Jesus is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. We are his body. And you need to understand that as a light in this world, as the church is still in this world, and we are a light in this ever-growing dark world, we're to illuminate the path that leads toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. We're to stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said and preserve his truth as a salt. But we are also to share the love of Christ. The light in us is not anything. The Bible says you can, you can be martyrs, you can know all scripture, but if you don't have love in your heart, you have nothing. And in being a light, we cannot, um, we cannot leave out the greatest component that we're told, which is love. And, and do not confuse loving with loving the world. We're told not to love the world. We're told not to conform to the ways of the world. So loving is not be quiet, silence truth, and just hold hands, sing kumbaya, and everybody believe the same thing. No, you are to stand on truth and share the good news, nothing wavering, but also love, love in the way that God has loved you. So we're instructed to be a light. And that light is not only um, guiding people toward their blessed hope, it's also loving, loving, um, loving as the Holy Spirit helps you love because the fruits of the Spirit, love is in there. God is love. And if you, the Bible says, if you claim to love God and you can't love your brother, then you don't know God because God is love. So we have to remember that love is very much a part of the light. Okay. Um, and let's see, these are the last two. Colossians 2, 4 to 8. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you um, with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Join and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, um, remember that Psalms 119, 105, again, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we have the shoes that were given in the armor, um, so much comes with those shoes. You know, we, we are to stand firm, nothing wavering on the gospel of Christ. We are um, to share the good news of the gospel. We are to walk in the power that we're given. We are to um, be about our father's business. And, and, and as a light in this world, guide many to their blessed hope toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. As the salt of the earth, we are to preserve the Lord's truth. But make no mistake, you are a soldier for the kingdom of God and the battle is real. So I pray and, 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 I, and I ask you, child of God, to understand of who it is that you believe. Understand who it is that is inside you. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. You have power to bind. You have power to loosen. And you are not to crouch down on the ground in a fetal position, allowing the enemy to have his way. You are to stand firm, stand your ground, be ready because the spiritual battle is real, but you are not left orphans. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. You've been given power over all the powers of the enemy. So um, prepare yourself, understand what it means to put on the whole armor, and then walk with the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding that no matter what you see, greater is he in you than he that is in the world, and God wins at the end. I've read the whole book, okay? Let's pray. 
Father Almighty God, I thank you very much for letting us have finished finally. Um, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you give understanding to every heart that has joined us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you just bless and sanctify them and give them the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding. May you empower them. May they understand, Father, um, that you are seated above all and have all under your feet and that you do win that you have a plan and it is perfect and that nothing that we're seeing has caught you by surprise, that every bit of it you've seen already and you have a plan and it is right and it is good and that you win. And so Lord, I just pray um, that you place your hedge of protection around each and every one of us, that you guide us according to your will and for your perfect glory, that you empower us and, and, and anoint us, Father, that we understand um, your plan and we understand uh, how to defend ourselves toward the tactics of the enemy father we speak against the works of the enemy it will not come near us yes or touch us in jesus mighty name because we are covered by the blood of the lamb blessed and protected by the almighty god we abide under the shadow of the almighty god and we will not be moved and so father we thank you we bless your holy name we praise you we give you glory and we ask father come lord jesus come amen and amen Thank you very much for joining us. Please subscribe, share, um, and uh, hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you can be notified of future videos. God bless you. Bye-bye.